Hello and welcome to Scripture Verse by Verse. My name is Michael Moret, and we're in the book of Ephesians, going verse by verse through the book of Ephesians. We come today to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 3. So get your Bible if you can and open it up to Ephesians chapter 2. While you're doing that, I'll tell you about the Scripture Verse by Verse website, which is where 35 years of archived studies, just like this, can be found. I've been doing this for over 35 years here on Scripture Verse by Verse, and I've saved my work. So there are four series going from Genesis through Revelation, archived for you right there. All you have to do is choose the series, the book of the Bible, the chapter, click and listen. And all you need to bring is your Bible to the Bibleversebyverse.com. And Father, we pray that you would sanctify us by your truth. Your word is truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, I'm going to begin reading in Ephesians 2 verse 1. We covered these first two verses, so I'll just read them. And you hath he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which in times past ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now worketh in the sons of disobedience. Simply put, the unsaved do the devil's bidding. Whether they realize it or not, they are controlled by sin. They are controlled by their sin nature. They are controlled by Satan and his devils. That's who's calling the shots. He uses their flesh, their sin nature, and leads them. And according to these verses, that's the way it used to be for people who are saved. In which times past ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air. If you're born again, if you've truly repented and received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you don't live like that anymore. It's not to say you don't sin. It's to say that you're not a part of that system. You don't want to be a part of that system. And when you do sin, you confess because you feel rotten about it. If that's not the case with you, you're kidding yourself. You're not saved. Three. Among whom also we all had, there we go again, our manner of life in times past, in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. So the unsaved are, by nature, children of God's wrath because they have a fallen nature that just naturally rebels against God. And they haven't been forgiven. They haven't been cleansed by the blood of Christ because they haven't repented and received Christ. So they are children of God's wrath because they have a sin nature, which just naturally rebels against God. The nature of sinful man is rebellious. Therefore, he naturally uses his body to express what is in his soul. And it's not good because it goes against God. This is what comes natural to sinful human beings because of their sin nature. This is why the world is in such a mess. It's because you got a bunch of sinners. The vast, vast majority of people are not saved, not dwelt by the Holy Spirit. They're being led about by the devil, his devils, his associates, and their sin nature, which is rebellious against God and destructive to each other. That's why the world is in such a mess. And people blame God. Well, if there was a God, things wouldn't be so rotten. There's God. He told you to stop doing it. You just don't listen. So don't blame God. 
Well, he should get rid of them. Then he'd get rid of you. You'd be first on the list. You old unsaved sinner. You'd be first one to get shot between the eyes if God was carrying a rifle. God's not willing that any should perish, but that, should, that all should come to repentance. So he's patient, and he's allowing evil to run its sinful course. You can put an end to this garbage, and you will burn in hell someday if you don't repent. So then you won't be talking so smart. God ought to do something about these sinners. Yeah, well, you're going to start with you, and he's going to end with you if you don't repent. It's what comes natural to sinful human beings because of their sin nature. And God is angry with them. Because sinful man is constantly irritating Almighty God. You are, if you're not saved, you are a constant pain in the neck to him. Verse 4. Good thing this is here. But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love with which he loved us. Yeah, man is full of sin. And man is rebellious by nature. But God is rich in mercy. And if he wasn't, we'd all be dead and in hell. God has more mercy than the worst sinner has sin. God's mercy is actually his love in action. Mercy is God not giving us what we deserve. God does not give us everything that we want. That's true. But he doesn't give us everything that we deserve either, which proves that he truly loves us and that he is very, very patient. To a degree, there is an end, you know. To five. Even when we were dead in sins, hath made us alive together with Christ. By grace ye are saved. So as he mentioned before, the non-Christians are spiritually dead because of their sins. And they are cut off from God because of their sin, because that's what spiritual death means, remember? It means to be cut off from God. Physical death destroys the body's ability to perceive anything around it. But sin has killed man's spirit, and along with it, man's ability to discern and perceive and communicate with God. You're dead. You're cut off from God if you're not saved. That's why the Word of God doesn't mean anything to the unsaved. That's why they think it's stupid. They think it's foolish. What do you want to do that for when I can live by my flesh and satisfy all my appetites? And Satan takes advantage of that. They're spiritually dead. They open up the Bible and say, that doesn't even make sense. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to live like that. That's a waste of my life. They're spiritually dead. They don't get it. That's right. The unsaved can read the Word of God, but not understand it. Doesn't mean anything. Because their spirit is dead. So what they are basically, what the unsaved are basically, are a broken receiver that cannot pick up even the strongest signal from God. But it's amazing, the moment a person repents of their sin and sincerely, with all their heart, asks Jesus Christ to come into their life to be their Lord and Savior, the moment they do that, their spirit comes alive and the communication lines between them and God is now open. You got a good working transmitter, and you got a good working receiver, and the connection between you and God is solid. And he hears your prayers and you hear what he is saying in the word of God. It all makes perfect sense. It's amazing how that happens. Six, and hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. The second 
that you receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you become a citizen of heaven. No tests to take, no exams, no background check. God's already, God already knows your background. And he doesn't care because you're forgiven. And the second you receive Christ, you become a citizen of heaven. And your soul and your experience, in your spirit, I should say, experience a huge change immediately. You are with Christ, as this verse says, in the heavenly places. And that refers to the realm where God rules, which is heaven. Your soul, your spirit is seated with Christ in God, in heavenly places, the place where God rules, heaven. Nobody disobeys God in heaven because your soul, if you're there, has new priorities and it wants to please God and it wants God to rule. Your soul and your spirit, are, are when you're in heaven, are free to talk to God because he hears you because you're without sin all the time. And even today, your soul and your spirit, if you're saved, are wide open to talk to God. He hears you. You're with God in the heavenly places. That's where your soul is. That's where your spirit is. You're seated with God in the heavenly places, meaning your priorities are in heaven if you're saved. And there's something deep down inside of you, just like the people who are up in heaven, literally, there's something deep down inside of you that wants God to rule every part of your life. Why? Because in a spiritual sense, you are seated with God right now in heaven. You're in that realm right now. That's where your home is. That's where your heart is. See? You're just hanging on to this old physical body while you're on this planet that kind of messes you up from time to time does what it wants to do instead of what you want it to do. And it can be real frustrating if you're a Christian. But look at 7. That in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. I love this verse because you know what it says? It says that we showcase God's grace. We Christians who are saved by God's grace who are sanctified by the grace of Almighty God, who are saved, who are forgiven, who are washed, who are cleansed, we Christians showcase God's grace. And we do not showcase anything good in and of ourselves. It's all God's grace. We are trophies of God's grace. And certainly that's going to be the case in heaven. The angels are going to look at us and say, how'd that guy get here? How did Moret get here? I saw how he lived. And the other angels say, well, he, he's a trophy of God's grace. He's a trophy of God's mercy and grace. That's how he got here. Oh, yeah. Wow, God has a lot of mercy. God has a lot of grace to get Moret up here. Yeah. Showcase of God's grace and mercy. That's us. The fact that Almighty God saved a no good, worthless sinner who is not worthy of saving and who has rebelled against Almighty God is all the evidence anyone needs to prove that God is full of grace and merciful. And we, who are Christians, are trophies of God's grace. And by the way, let's, let's lay this lie to rest once and for all. Because I'm so sick and tired of modern evangelicals saying this. And their, and their little modern evangelical psychobabble subculture. <gasps> because they want you to feel so good about yourself. <gasps> you look how wonderful you are. I've heard them say this. You are so wonderful that the Son of God died on the cross to pay for your sin. You complete idiot. You blasphemous fool. How dare you say something so incredibly stupid 
an anti-Bible and defame God in the process. God died for me because I'm such a wonderful person. Therefore, you should feel good about yourself. You wretched, miserable liar. Nothing could be further from the truth. Get this in your head, please. God did not die for us because we are worth so much. Because we're so wonderful. He just couldn't resist us. No. Touchy-feely Christian psychologists and psychobabblers and the preachers who read their books and follow them and mimic them in their sermons, so-called, are, are completely worthless in what they say. Jesus died for us, not because we were so wonderful and he couldn't resist us and we're, so, and we're worth so much. He died for us because he is so gracious. And we were sinners who had lost their, our worth when we sinned. We, the Bible says we have become worthless to God in the book of Romans. And that is what makes God's grace so wonderful. He died for us not because we're wonderful, but because we're worthless in spite of the fact that we're worthless. You say, well, that hurts my self-esteem. Good, because you, you don't have anything to esteem. You're a filthy, vile, rotten sinner like me. Worthless, God says. And who told you you're supposed to have self-esteem beside the Christian psychologists and Christian counselors and so many Christian pastors out there, so-called? No wonder that modern evangelicalism is such a miserable mess. Who told you you were supposed to have self-worth? God never did. God never mentions it in the Bible. He never even suggests it. It's never even implied. We're not supposed to have self-worth. We're supposed to have Christ work worth. We're supposed to be appreciative of the fact that Jesus loves us in spite of our worthlessness. He saved us from hell in spite of our utter, work, utter worthlessness. And that should stir us up to want to serve him out of love and appreciation. That's the message of Scripture. Well, we need to get back to the Bible, don't we? So this is why I teach the Bible and nothing else. You won't hear any psychobabble here. The only psychobabble you will hear here is the psychobabble that I blast with both barrels because it's so ungodly and unbiblical. I don't care how good it sounds to you. Oh, I've had people get ticked off at me. Go ahead. You know what that means? It means you're part of the problem. You want to be a part of this ministry? It teaches a straight word of God. You can't be. But praying for me. I sure you need your prayers. And pray for the word of God. Because without your prayers, without, without my prayers, the word of God, I don't know. No power there. Well, there's, I don't want to say that because there's power in the Word of God. But, but our prayers really do help the Word of God. It's effectiveness. I believe that. So pray for me. Pray for God's Word. And again, study the whole Bible with me at thebibleversebyverse.com. Get close to God by studying the whole counsel of God verse by verse. And when you take a break from studying, go to the front page at thebibleversebyverse.com and click the donate button and prayerfully give as the Lord may lead. And those are ways that you can become a part of this ministry and help me get out God's word. And there's nothing more important that we can do. It's a dark world. Even modern evangelicalism, it's a dark, dark world for the most part. You guys know that. A lot of you know that. I've talked to you. You've written me. You know exactly what I'm talking about. We need to get out God's word without watering it down. So let's do it. What do you say? Until next time, Michael Moret 
for Scripture Verse by Verse. So long, everyone.